Welcome to the almost annual Urban, Hudson Urban Forestry Forum. Um, we have a great featured speaker today from the University of Minnesota, Chad Giblin. But to, before we begin, I invite Sarah uh, I, Atkins Hoggett to uh, welcome you. Hi, everyone. Um, I didn't know I was going to say hi to everyone, so I'm going to wing it. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who aren't wearing name tags, I want to just thank you for coming. I'm the city council person that represents the downtown district here, and I'm also the one that sits on the Hudson Urban Forestry Board. I'm the newest member, and so if you have questions about anything afterwards, you can go to somebody else. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, so we, uh, the layout here is uh, we have a keynote and uh, speaker, Chad, and then Mike uh, Mraz, our new public works director, is going to give an update on the Emerald Ashbor program, tree program in the city. And then we can go downstairs and we have several topic tables, different topics that you can talk to experts at down there and enjoy some refreshments. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Chad Giblin, who's a research fellow and a jolly good fellow. Um, I've known him for a long time because I worked in Minnesota at the DNR and the Urban Forestry Program, and Chad uh, provided, and his, and his underlings provided a lot of the research that we used in workshops across Minnesota. So he decided to come across the river and, and share his knowledge, and so you want to give us the title of the talk and, and go for it? Sounds good, yeah, thanks, Ken. So, um and I guess I was told that I do have to mount the stage. I was hoping to do it more TEDx style down here, but I'm going to be a little more distant up there. But um, and then just to confirm, AV, I do have to go back up, right? Okay. I mean, it feels a lot more natural down here. I'd prefer it. Okay. I'm going to grab my um, remote and I'll, I'll come back down. <clears throat> Yeah, well, thanks, Ken, for such a warm introduction, and, and really thank you for making my presence here possible. I mean, that's so much of what we do in Minnesota, as far as urban forestry, really is thanks to Ken's work at the Minnesota DNR. So um, it's pretty neat to see the legacy continuing here in Hudson. And uh, yeah, thanks to Mike, and where's Gail? Had a great tour today, kind of saw some pretty epic, you know, old growth trees here. And I'm excited to talk a little bit about what we're doing at U of M kind of share some thoughts. It's going to be um, pretty informal, so if you have a comment or question, um, yeah, just shout it out or throw your hand up. Um, you know, I, I got multiple points where I can cut my presentation super short and only get through five slides instead of 187. No, it's, it's not that long, I swear. But, um, but yeah, so just kind of with a little background from Ken, I, I was just thinking about, you know, how, how can we think about what we do at home when it comes to our trees, our sort of personal part of the urban forest that's not only benefiting us as residents, as property owners, but then also contributing to the benefits that we all realize as, as residents of the larger urban forest. And I think all the research that we have now really indicates that, that decisions that we make even a mile away from our house, a quarter mile away, can influence energy savings, property values, all that really um, is compounding at the community level. So. You know, we, we kind of some, sometimes have to take one for the team, so to speak, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, the main thing I want to talk about is sort of like these paradigm shifts, these uh, concepts that we're promoting when it comes to making decisions at home that contribute to, in this case, the urban forest in Hudson, and finding ways that we can continue to benefit, you know, both our, our own families, our houses, and our, and our neighbors. So, so um, yeah, so making, it's, it's your urban forest, and you could be on, uh, you know, here in Hudson, you know, I live in St. Paul. Um, the model community for my presentation is Minneapolis. Uh, I've been working with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for about 20 years now. So we have a lot of great data from, from their urban forest as well. So we'll jump right in. So um, I'm gonna throw this up just in case I don't get to the end. Um, if you wanna get in touch with me, um, there's my email address. And I'm gonna go through my slides, I think most most of the photos are mine. I can post them freely. I'll, I'll post a, a PDF document of the presentation tonight with a few notes. If you want to share it with your, with your colleagues, with your friends, I'll, 
that's no problem, and you can access that at, at trees.umn.edu. We have a publications tab, and you can just download the PDF with, with my notes and, and annotations. If I put this down, I, I think this is a small enough crowd. We can... Oh, geez. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and I also, I'm also an instructor at the U, so I, I hear, like, oh, that, that's a thing, right? And I go, I learned about lit last year. That was kind of cool. It's like, that's lit, Chad. And I go, well, of course, you know, what does that mean? So tree benefits are a thing. So we know that, um, you know, trees are cool. They look cool. They give us a lot of fun things to do, like tree climbing if you're on a younger crowd, or maybe landscape photography or artwork for those of us that are, well, I still climb trees. But um, we know that trees provides tangible financial and ecological benefits to us as well. So these, they, they are a thing, and they're totally lit, too. Um, I'm going to use Minneapolis as a model community here, mostly because it's a community that I have worked with for a long time, and we have a lot of uh, good data on Minneapolis and their urban forests. So this, this is kind of a neat um, feature here with um, the Davey Resource Group provides for Minneapolis a, an assessment of the ecological benefits of their urban forest on a nightly basis. So based on 214,000 public trees in Minneapolis, they realize you know, just over $15 million in yearly eco-benefits. So this tells us one thing is that, one, you need to know what's there before you can assess your benefits, and then, two, it's a really good way to promote the value and the tangible asset that the urban forest provides to a community. So I know Mike and Gail were talking a little bit about, you know, that inventory being such a critical tool. I mean, this for Minneapolis has become great leverage for gaining funds, and just support for urban forestry programs. So we'll kind of break down these benefits here. So I just had to make it big because $15 million is like, whoa, that's, that is a thing. That's a substantial amount of money. So let's figure out how that works. So it, it kind of breaks down into a number of different categories. Um, I want to mention the water benefits first. And this is sort of a, as far as controversies go in the urban forestry world, which aren't really controversies, there, there is a bit of a, discussion over how much stormwater benefits we, we realize, particularly through street trees or those boulevard trees that are in between the sidewalk and the street. So um, that's kind of being debated right now. But otherwise, we can realize, you know, very tangible benefits. You know, obviously the CO2 sequestration. I mean, wood's a very good carbon storage source. That's, that's a no-brainer. Moving down to energy benefits, blocking sunlight in the summertime, shading benefits, and even uh, Heating benefits in the winter by blocking northerly or northwest winds. That's a very, very tangible benefit. And then air quality, so sort of removing all these pollutants, ozone, et cetera, from our urban canopy. So each of these things is sort of drilled down and quantified in, you know, multiple millions of dollars. So it's a really neat thing that you can promote your urban forest at an Arbor Day. And it can happen anywhere. And property benefits, I pulled this out because this is a little bit different because this provides you know, a direct benefit to property owners, you know, having about $5 million, $5.2 million in property value increase thanks to the urban forest in Minneapolis. So that's a really big thing. And that's a forest, that's a urban infrastructure that really requires investment and, and, and care and, and maintenance. So that's kind of how we kick it off and really um, providing the, the impetus for taking care of an urban forest. And this is kind of where I'll, I'll kind of get into you know, my content, that's the stuff I, this is screenshots off the internet. So um, a lot of times we, we, you know, we hear from folks that say, well, what's the best tree to plant? You know, it's, you know, I love maple trees. And it's like, yeah, I do too. Um, I probably would not want to plant one in a typical boulevard in St. Paul or Minneapolis because uh, if you look at, at history and you look at some famous um, folks from Minneapolis, um, you know, everyone knows Charles Loring, right? They named the pasta bar after him and uh, actually, the, the park came first, but Charles Loring, you know, he was really sort of considered the, the father of the Minneapolis park system. His vision, his work with landscape architects like uh, Horace Cleveland and uh, others really created this chain of lakes park system, making Minneapolis sort of this ideal crown jewel urban forest, you know, I mean, maybe just a little bit behind Central Park, but really just developed this vision of the urban forest for the working class of Minneapolis. You know, folks back early 20th century really needed respite. It was sort of this playground movement. Okay, you work all day, you need to get away from it all at night. Minecraft wasn't invented then, so we needed real forests. So, um, so Charles Loring said, yeah, I want to plant thousands and thousands of trees and create 
the forest for Minneapolis, the urban forest. Charles Loring loved American elms. He loved them so much that he personally provided money to buy 1,200 American elms to line Victory Memorial Drive in North Minneapolis. And he said that he wanted to honor folks from Hennepin County that died in World War I. So they planted thousands and thousands of American elm all over Minneapolis. And Char Charles Loring had you know, this vision, you know, in time there'll be stately giants and they'll be incredible. And, and he was right. I mean, they, they actually achieved that. But in a minute, we'll kind of talk about, you know, the unfortunate legacy of the American elm. And Theodore Wirth over here, he's got a, a chalet and a, and a golf course named after him in a, in a park, you know, so another protege of, of Charles Loring. And they planted American elms like crazy and they had just wonderful high-vis PPE back in the day. And just really converted a lot of this old farmland in Minneapolis to create, you know, these just majestic lion streets on, on the north side and just sort of considered the pinnacle of urban forestry, the golden age, so to speak. Unfortunately, what they didn't think about back in 1910 or 1915 was that this little, well, they didn't have plastic plates back then, but this, this was already arriving in, in, in America. And it was a little fungus that came over from Holland via China, or China via Holland, and it was about to spell the doom for Charles Loring's vision and, and the urban forest of, of Minneapolis. So we have a native elm bark beetle, um, Hylogopinus rufipus, which is kind of a troublemaker when it comes to Dutch elm disease. It, it feeds on diseased trees and then spreads it via small hairs on the body. But unfortunately, we introduced the European elm bark beetle at the same time as a fungus, and it went crazy. And we see through root grafting, you know, a sharing of vascular tissue between elm trees, um, Minneapolis for example, went from this to losing about 90% of its urban forest canopy. So thinking about legacy, about Charles Loring and his vision, unfortunately, the best thing to come out of that was the establishment, the vision of the urban forest, because he, he clearly established that and, and had the vision to make this the urban playground for Minneapolis of the future. But the trees themselves, unfortunately, were a complete failure. The best thing to come out of it now that we have left is Elm or the elm tree, and he's pretty cool. And there's, I mean, there's a few elm, remnant elms too that are out there and really gracing the streets. But unfortunately, that legacy, the stately giants, didn't barely survived 70 or even 80 years, which is pretty short in in term in tree years, unfortunately. So, I'm not disparaging Charles Loring or his vision. It's a very clear and, and defined vision. But the monoculture playing favorites clearly did not work for Charles Loring or Minneapolis. Emerald ash borer. I think we don't need to. Everyone knows what this is, right? The beetle, again, fortunately, it, it was introduced to the U.S. It loves invading our native ash trees, green, white, and black ash, chews them up, girdles the, um, the inner bark, the vascular tissue, and we go from streets like this, you know, losing about 25% of our public urban forest canopy, probably double that, maybe a little more when we, when we include private canopy. So the backyard, side yard, front yard canopy really um, we see a lot more losses because there's just more trees out there. So Minneapolis decided, well, how are we going to deal with this? We want to eliminate ash before they're completely dead and gone, while we can still preemptively take care of it. So they're re basically removing all public ash trees in Minneapolis and replanting them with non-ash species, non-EAB hosts. Emerald ash borer only feeds on it, only kills ash trees. So it's not going to kill an elm tree. It's not going to kill the maple tree. But thankfully, I mean, not thankfully, there's there's this critter, this is Asian longhorn beetle, if you want a three letter code to go with it, it's ALB, and this is probably what's next, and this eats everything else. So um, and it's just through sheer domination of the tree, it destroys the inner parts, the inner workings, giant bugs, giant larvae, taking our beautiful Freeman maple forests to losing you know, roughly 30% of, of our public canopy in, in most most communities. So kind of a lot of doom and gloom here, right? It's like, oh, 90%, 30%, 20%. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big problem. But what we're seeing is that because we've been playing favorites for about 100 years or more, going from elms to maples to ash, we're continuously losing canopy. So now it's all about diversity and how can we contribute to diversity, even in our backyards, by not, not playing favorites, not planting your favorite tree. And on top of that, again, Asian longhorn beetle eats elm trees. So we're going to lose the last 10% of our elms, you know, birch, buckeye, sycamores, et cetera. It, it eats all that stuff. But 
Asian longhorn beetle is a little bit different. We can, we can eradicate that. It's a large beetle. You can easily sort of rogue it out and eliminate basically a clear cut a neighborhood. Ravenswood in Chicago, they were able to eradicate ALB in the neighborhood and prevent its spread. So it's a little bit different than EAB, the emerald ash borer, which is a little more insidious. It kind of hides underneath your nose in the neighborhood and kind of sneaks up on you before you know it, it's too late. So, so we do have some options with ALB. But again, the point here is that we, we have a strong legacy of, of a lack of diversity in our urban tree population. Um, not a lack of commitment by any means, a very strong commitment, but unfortunately some, some poor decision making when it comes to diversity. So um, we were getting better. I mean, like people say, like, didn't you learn anything from Dutch elm disease? And it's like, yeah, we didn't plant 90% ash. We only planted 30%. So, um, but a few new favorites. So now we're thinking about how do we respond to the, the, the three letter problems, DED, Dutch elm disease, EAB, emerald ash borer, ALB, Asian longhorn beetle. And we kind of have to take one for the team because this is a time when we don't get to plant our favorite tree like the giant, beautiful American elms or the stately sugar maples or the beautiful red Freeman maples. We're going to have to choose other trees that are more resilient, that are more adaptable to a changing climate, and a much more um, hostile urban environment in terms of, of growth conditions and so forth. So with trees that you know, we're excited about, obviously, are Kentucky coffee tree. And it's interesting, I, I teach dendrology at the U, and I say, like, you know, students, if you want to drop the uh, Kentucky part, you can just call it coffee tree because it's a Minnesota native, and it's, it's finding in the, in the same areas in western Wisconsin, this is native in, it's, it's more native than river birch in, in my home state of Minnesota. So it's, don't let the Kentucky part fool you. It's okay for the Midwest. So um, really cool tree, super tough urban chops. Um, the female has a really cool, outstanding seed pod, which some people might not, not find cool. So you can plant a seedless male variety that's uh, clonally produced, and you won't have those, those fruiting pods. So um, just a beautiful tree. It's not going to achieve the stature or the presence of the trees of old, but it's a tree that will survive in some of the worst, again, most hostile urban conditions. So just a wonderful replacement. And, yeah, and a pretty nice yellow fall color, too, if yellow is your thing. Uh, some of the largest coffee trees I've seen are probably in the 50, 60 foot range. Anyone else seen anything bigger, Scott or Ken, anyone? Anything bigger than 50 or 60? That's a big one. There's a, like a giant one in, in a St. Paul alley that's really kind of epic. Scott, have you seen anything bigger than 50 or so? Yeah, and, but they're pretty cool, aren't they? I mean, I mean, really neat, you know. Yeah, yeah, kind of Jurassic, you know, and it's got the biggest leaf um, of any deciduous tree in North America, so you got that going for it if you want to plant coffee tree. Um, when it's young, the hard sell with coffee tree is that at, at planting, it's a stick when you plant it. It literally looks like a broomstick, and it's like, oh my goodness, what did what did you plant in my boulevard? Give it time, it, it it's, you know, it's like that, um, that little puppy, you know, it's kind of, whoa, I thought you were supposed to be cute. And it's like, oh yeah, you get really cute in time. But um, it, is, it is a great tree, um, but you, you do have to invest in it and you have to give it time to, to return that benefit. So we're finding that trees like this are becoming the, the new normal. Um, Turkish filbert, um, I saw a lot of lindens today, a lot of tilia. So American linden and the European tilia cordata, a tree that's excessively planted, overly planted, um, structurally, it falls apart a lot, a lot of problems with wind, ice loading, and snow loading. So we want to find trees that give that same ethic or um, aesthetic, rather. And we have a neat uh, Turkish filbert, so a very upright, very compact pyramidal form that inter interestingly has really good urban site tolerance as well. So this is one that's been used um, frequently in Minneapolis, Park Board, and other parts of the Twin Cities. Again, if you like yellow, you're in luck. It's, it's yellow again. <laughs> again but. Um, a really nice, again, smaller stature tree, but one that consistently performs in these narrow, dry, salty, difficult urban sites. So just, uh, just another option. And again, I, this is only two of three. I'm not going to give you a list of 40 trees because that's, that's what the Internet's for. We're thinking about more about how do we shift our thinking, moving away from our favorite sugar maple, red maple, American elm, basswood into new species that just provide new options 
and more resilience for our changing urban forests. Now, for those of you that like crab apples, that's great. I love crab apples in the spring. In fact, this spring, I'm going to need like a super big dose of crab apples to get me out of this winter funk. But we have Amarmachia, which is a really cool tree from the Amar region in China that gives us options to diversify our small, under the power lines, flowering plant selection with another tree that's really providing a lot of good benefits in terms of aesthetic quality, great summertime flowers, and interesting, we call this zombie bark. It's like, ugh, walking dead tree. It's kind of gross and green and peely, so we, it's kind of, I didn't invent that phrase, my predecessor did, but um, it's, it's got a lot of neat features, and here's an um, interesting shot of the flower. So that provides us more diversity for our small ornamental or flowering type um, um, areas where we want to plant small trees in, the, in those downtown districts, those smaller site spaces. So how do we deal with all of these issues and these, um, you know, these threats to urban forests? The big thing is that you know, we know that we need large trees, right? So the trees like the American elm, like the ash, like the maples do provide benefits. So we want to plant large trees whenever we can, but there's a pretty good chance that we're not going to see 80 to 100 foot urban forest canopy like we saw back in the pre-Dutch elm disease days in, in the 70s and 80s. And that's probably not a bad thing because we're going to see a forest that's, that's more diverse, that we'll be able to survive in much higher quantities. So we won't see entire blocks slicked off and, and losing 100% of their canopy or 90% of their canopy. So in Minneapolis, uh, Philip Patyandi, Ralph Sievert, and others are really developing a very, very aggressive block level, neighborhood level diversity program where they're specifying that they know that they, they still need large shade trees. So they're going to seek out trees that, that can fill that high canopy shade roll. And again, they're, they're avoiding these ALB hosts, birch, buckeye, maple, elm, plane tree. That's pretty much everything else that's out there right now. And thinking about these other species here. You know, so we know about coffee tree, we just talked about it. Honey, locust, ginkgo, the oaks, you know, those are still okay options, you know. Um, small, we're looking at crab apple, we talked about the machia, some native species, ironwood. You know, a service berry, great native, smaller statured flowering species. And again, what they're assessing is, is that they want to avoid that catastrophic block level canopy loss by examining very closely, and this, this is Winona neighborhood in the south, I got this from Philip at the park board. They already know that they're over the limit, over this 10% genus limit, so we don't want to plant 10% of any oak, any maple, any elm, et cetera, and just stop planting those and plant more hackberry or more tree lilac or ginkgo. Did you have a question? What about planting more willows? Yeah, so planting more willows, and you know, willow is a great tree, like maybe weeping willow or, so, um, but when we're talking about, you know, like a, think about the, maybe the space in front of your house or at your school or by the playground, willow trees tend to grow really, really fast, but they don't necessarily live a long time, so it's kind of a, a really fast growing tree, and then it kind of gets all like, like an octopus, and next thing you know, like just big branches falling off, and it's like, whoa, we planted that tree next to a playground? What were you thinking? So willows we like to put maybe in like the backyard or maybe in the back of an old farmstead or old pasture where we have a lot of space where it's not gonna maybe um, find someone or something to fall on. So when we think about trees like out on your street or by your school or by a store, willows might not work the best there, unfortunately. But it's a, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love willow, it's a super cool tree, but we kind of put it away from where we would have a lot of um, people, cars, dogs, you know, motorhomes, things like that. So good question though, Maddie. Um, and then kind of thinking about how this urban forest plays out, I, I've, I've heard, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm kind of running out, right? Okay, <laughs> okay. You know, and I've heard, you know, a few interesting reports from, you know, landscape architects and designers and so forth, and even quotes like, you know, every famous street in the world is lined by this single variety, single species of trees. So how can we create these epic locations in our world without having this allay of elms or allay of maples? And, and the fact is, is that we can, because most folks just want trees. We don't need them to be all elms or all maples or all hackberry. Um, and this is Victory Memorial Drive, you know, 100 years after planting, and it, it's a very diverse landscape. And we, you can't tell now because it's the winter time, but you know, there's 
maybe 5% or less of those original American elms left, and the rest is hackberry, you know, maybe some honey locust, maybe a few maples. And it's still a very vibrant, a very vital and supportive urban forest, but it's just not 100% American elm. So, you know, us as residents, as stewards of our private property urban forest know that we can accept that. It's just convincing maybe designers, upper level decision makers that you know, we need to be really diligent when making plant choices that aren't, aren't your favorite. So that's the end of that section. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, so and that's a bit of a controversy too. So there, there's a bit of data out there now that indicates that we need native species to support native insects, native birds, native mammals, and so forth. Um, other research indicates that birds, insects, critters, squirrels, possums, um, raccoons, they'll live in anything. Um, I don't really know, I don't have a strong opinion yet. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that as long as we have trees, and it's particularly for, for animals, for critters, uh, larger trees. So like uh, Gail's talking about co uh, cottonwoods supporting a cool bald eagle population along the river. Um, cavities and basswoods or other trees for squirrels, for possum, et cetera, you know, other cavity nesting birds. So um, small trees aren't gonna provide that same benefit. You know, if they have fruits, if they have nectar, if they have flowers, there's some benefit there to pollinators and insects, but the, the larger mammals and birds, I think, um, require large shade trees, which I think as we grow and as climates change and adjust, we're gonna see increasing threats to our large established older, older growth shade trees, particularly uh, we're seeing a lot of issues with, with burr oaks in Minnesota. Um, so preserving that, I think, preserving what we have has become even more critical as we lose large ash and it continued to lose large elms? Super good question. Should I spend five more minutes or should we cut it? Cool. Any other questions on diversity? Yeah, so the internet, I mean, that's what, you can just type in what tree to plant for Hudson, Wisconsin. Autumn blaze Freeman maple, uh, no, no. The, you know, I hesitate to say Minnesota coffee tree, but I mean, it's, it's a Minnesota native, so. I remember my boss, Gary Johnson, was scolded one time by someone that didn't know their business. Like, you can't plant that here, that's from Kentucky. And it's like, no. Just down from my grandpa's farm, a century farm in, in Houston County, there's a really cool native grove of coffee tree. And it's, it's full on Minnesotan. You know, I mean, we're, I'm in Wisconsin now, but same, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so, you know, once you choose your tree, once you have that growing in your front yard, side yard, backyard, or even in your urban boulevard, you know, you, you need to invest in it. And I, I even got this tree in here twice. Um, so Theodore Wirth and Charles Loring and them, you know, they really knew how to really whip trees into shape, you know, to get them out and started in the best way. And what you can see here is that these are, these are giant trees. These are American elms, so they can, they can take it. But they're, they're bare root, there's no soil, there's no plastic Bailey Nurseries pot, and they're large. I mean, these are average size dudes and they're holding a big shade tree. So these were really established canopy at the time of planting. Now we have more attractive sort of retailable, is that a word? I don't know, saleable trees. But back then, people were too busy working two jobs to pay attention, and next thing you knew, you had an urban forest. But now, we see that we go from theater worst trees like this to a kind of a crazy sort of canopy that provides a miniature effect of what we would hope to see in maybe 50 or 80 years. And unfortunately, this type of modern canopy uh, doesn't take care of itself. Elms, maples, you name it, they don't they don't self-prune because they're not in, in the forest anymore. They're, they're moving from the forest to the urban forest and we become the shade, the, the, the folks that take care of those trees. So when you look at, at um, a small tree planting, whether it's a coffee tree, locust, maple, elm, you know, if, if you're not visiting that tree once or twice within the first 10 years, when you decide to visit it and take care of it, it's gonna be too late you will have already have missed the opportunity to create a tree that will achieve a very high canopy. And you'll almost end up with sort of this dwarf bonsai type thing. It's, it's permanently dwarf. It's gonna have lower branches, a shorter height, and just less benefits than something that was maintained at a much younger age or a much earlier time in its life. So, 
And again, I mentioned elms and other trees. Again, I'll make fun of autumn blaze uh, maple again. Don't get me wrong, it's got the best fall color in the world. I love it. It's, it's, it's a tough cookie, though. Um, those kind of trees, you almost have to visit every couple years, or else the next time you come there, it's going to be split in half, and you'll have you know, half A and half B. And despite the duct tape we see on the trees, they don't grow back together. So um, and just as an example here, and I think I'll probably close out on this. Um, this is a Valley Forge American Elm. It's, it's a pretty cool tree because it's one of the most Dutch elm disease resistant trees ever discovered. The USDA selected this from a seedling population of thousands of American elms. It can receive a full dose of a Dutch elm disease fungus in the main stem and essentially survive. So it's a really resilient, tough tree. It has all the great um, urban site chops that the American elm has with that disease resistance, so it's not going to be killed by, by Dutch elm disease. But unfortunately, it forms really weak branches. So as those branches are attached to the tree, you could walk up to that tree and get a workout just by tearing that tree in half. So I know this tree well because I grew it from a small little cutting, like a, a little slip that you would do like with a spider plant. And one of our grad students said, hey, I, I live in this apartment building. I want, I want some shade. So I go, yeah, American elm would be a great choice. But I didn't, I didn't hear from her for about three or four years, and this is what I came to, and it's like, whoa, we got, we got some instant shade here. So what do we do now? And what we see is that um, the longer we wait to take care of our young trees, especially fast-growing trees like elms or even willows, you know, so willow trees are a great tree that you need to take care of when they're really young too. Maples, silver maples, lindens or basswood. Um, if you wait, you end up having to make really large cuts on the tree. You're putting a lot more of that tree through the chipper into the brush pile than, than you would put into the canopy that should have been growing high above it. So when you take a shade organism like an elm tree or a maple tree and put it into the full sun, it says, well, I mean, forget you, I'm just going to grow sideways. I mean, I don't need to grow up anymore. There's no, there's no competition, so I'm going to maximize what I can do, grow sideways and make seeds, and then I don't really care what happens next. So we have to provide a pruning prescription to take care of a tree and return it to that theater worth sort of beanpole style using our saws, using our pruners, and sometimes using, you know, harnesses, ropes, and saddles. And the catch is that if you, if you wait too long, you'll, you'll run out of time. So just kind of giving you an idea, on, on, on a pretty large branch that I removed on this tree here, you know, it's probably about two inches, give or take, even if I'd just come two years earlier, it would have been pinky size even just one year prior, it would have been half that size. So as these young trees grow, their defect and then their growth rate becomes almost exponential, and you end up sending a lot more of that tree, again, through the chipper and losing the potential to produce a taller, higher canopy. So we call it developmental pruning, and you're investing in pushing canopy up higher, out of the way of your lawnmower, your trucks, your UPS vehicles, et cetera, and then you establish a canopy that's much more easy to maintain above the public infrastructure that's below it. And if you wait too long, essentially trees, again, grow exponentially, and then they, they, it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if. It's mostly a matter of, of when, and they fail. And unfortunately, that's the case. Um, my grandpa, at one time, he had, he had a autumn blaze maple he just loved, and he didn't, he kind of liked the branching, you know, he didn't want me to prune it, et cetera. And with time, it eventually just split to the ground, and we cut it down and planted a, a crab apple, you know, which is, which is okay. But, um, for the urban forest, for the trees that we want to establish providing benefits for the future, we don't want to be replacing our canopy every 15, every 20 years. And again, just a few more examples. This is a hackberry tree um, growing on a Minneapolis Boulevard, and again, kind of an autumn blaze Freeman maple. So even if we have a slow establishment period after planting, once those roots sort of colonize the, the soil, we see that exponential growth where this tree went from, this is a marker here, from about an you know, inch and a half branch to almost tripling in size over four years and making a large cut on a tree like a hackberry that has very low decay tolerance, it becomes hollow very easily. We're kind of dooming this tree to a short life just by not visiting it frequently enough. And the same for a Freeman maple or autumn blaze. Um, it's a soft wood, it's, it's again not decay resistant. If you make big cuts on trees like that, they, they fail prematurely just due to internal decay and defects that could have been prevented by more frequent maintenance. So, you know, people tend to disparage silver maples and red maples for being, you know, sort of junk trees, but when you make a large cut on the tree because you're worried about that branch maybe falling on your car or shading the garden, 
you're sort of automatically resigning that tree to failure in the future because trees don't like to have really large branches cut off it. They just can't tolerate or resist the entrance of decay organisms into that, into that wood. So, you know, in the pruning young trees, you know, looking at kids running around, they do like a face plant on the asphalt, and they go, oh my God, call them nine one. Oh wait, the kid's back up again. They can, they can walk it off. Young trees can, can walk it off. Old trees can. They, they decay and they die and they have to be cut down. So invest in that first 10 years and you'll get a 100 year tree you know, very easily. And whether you want to do it or hire an arborist to do it, little trees just as much as big trees require maintenance every couple, three years, probably at least. Or at least a look, look at them. I think there I can turn it over to Mike and um, we made it 75% through, so. Yeah. Okay. Any, que any more questions for Jeff? We could, we could talk about favorite trees until Mike's ready. I know we got a willow in the front. What are some other favorite trees out there? How about you, Liz? I don't know. I wish it would go away. I, I mean, I, I mean, Kentucky's fine, but I think just coffee tree is, is fine. It is, it is. You know, we, we've had individuals like, you know, wanting to administer grants saying like, no, no, you can't plant that, it's not native, you know. It's like, no, it's totally native. Um, cool, well thanks Ken, and I'll turn it over to Mike. And Thank, to thank, thank you so much, Chad. And uh, as Chad mentioned, he'll be posting his presentation on the internet uh, under the U of M uh, urban uh, publications. And uh, we are, are also have uh, cable access TV here and uh, they will be posting uh, this presentation, Mike's too, uh, on the webpage for the uh, city of Hudson. So people that have been in Hudson for a while know the name Tom Zuli, and Tom was our, our recently retired public works and park director. and. Uh, Tom was really energetic. I call him Mr. Green Thumbs. And he, he established a legacy for um, planting a diversity of trees, adopting some of these new techniques like gravel bed systems. Uh, so I, I encourage you to go downstairs afterwards and uh, get some details on some of these other techniques that we've employed. But we are just thrilled to have Mike Mraz here as Tom's replacement. He's going to do a, a really great job. So he has an update on the program. All right, I'm gonna go up on the stage. <laughs> Something different. So again, my name is Michael Mraz. Uh, started working for the city of Hudson uh, in August, so I've been on a job for about six months. And I'm just gonna briefly discuss um, Emerald Ash Borer within the city, uh, what the city is doing, uh, what they have been doing, um, and kind of what we're looking to do in the future. Like Ken said, uh, Tom and the Hudson Urban Forestry Board have done a great job preparing for um, this eventual invasion of the EAB, and I, the city itself is in a really good position moving forward. Um, so at first, uh, planning efforts back in 2012, uh, the city of Hudson developed a street tree inventory. And as part of that, uh, they also developed a Emerald Ash Borer response plan, uh, which we still follow today. And it kind of highlights you know, our removal processes, our treating processes, where we're gonna plant, so on and so forth. So um, up here on the right-hand side uh, is a basically a, um, a image of the city of Hudson. And all these dots are all different species of trees. And this is our street tree inventory. And it inventories all the public trees in the city of Hudson. And what's cool about it is uh, anybody in the community, anybody can go on this because it's on the cloud. So it's hard to see down here, um, but you can just type in Wisconsin Community Tree Map in Google, and it'll bring you up to that, and you can type in Hudson, and it'll give you an idea of you know, the number of maple trees in the boulevards, the number of ash trees in the boulevards, so on and so forth. It separate, you can separate and toggle uh, by the species. And what's nice about this is staff uses it for maintenance purposes, so we have an idea of those areas in town that are highly uh, populated with ash trees, and we go and treat those or remove those areas and try to get some more diversity in those areas like Chad was talking about. So a really neat tool. I encourage you to, to go out and take a look at it. It's a really neat kind of um, you know, inventory that we use on a daily basis. So the implementation of the plan, um, kind of the main thing is, is the main theme is, is keep the best 
replace the rest. So in keeping the best, what the city's goal was and in this plan is to treat 10% of the public trees. So I'm, I'm happy to say we got an uh, urban forestry grant through the DNR uh, this year, through Wisconsin DNR. Uh, with some of those monies, we'll be able to meet our goal of treating 10% of the um, ash trees in the city, public ash trees. Um, we started off with uh, 14,000 total. We removed some of those ash trees that were, you know, defective, underneath power lines, so on and so forth. So we're left with about 1,100 ash trees in the city. And with the, uh, you know, the treating, the addition of an additional 20 to 30 trees this year, we'll be up to that 10%. We'll be treating about 125 ash trees. Um, so we're treating ash trees in parks, uh, green spaces, around public buildings, uh, like schools. Um, and then what we're doing is, and what homeowners will want to do, is you know kind of use the same metrics that the city's using to determine whether or not to replace the ash tree or remove it so if you have an ash tree in your private yard and you you know there's some sentimental value or it provides really good shade um, it's just a great looking tree you know you're going to want to take the time over the next year to start treating that because emerald ash borer has been confirmed in the city so uh, don't wait until you see the signs that it is declining now's the time to start treating so and there's some different options as far as treating uh, the city itself has been injecting it seems to be the most uh, beneficial and the, and the longest lasting and just to give you an idea uh, if you inject a tree um, it's about eight to ten dollars per diameter inch and recommendation is every every year every two years um, once once you start injecting it you're going to want to inject it for the rest of its life if you don't want to lose that tree so i kind of touched on this stages of the removal uh, the city identified you know those trees that were high risk you know structurally deficient where they were located uh, under here you know we had this is this is in a tree in the city, but I just saw it's pretty cool. Um, you know, trees that are underneath utility lines. You know, there's no reason to really save that tree, so removing them. Here's a defective tree. You know, that's ready to split in a storm. Um, this one over here is upheaving a sidewalk panel. Um, probably not the right tree in the right place in that instance. So uh, that would be on our place to to remove. And then also we're looking at uh, taking down a number of uh, ash trees that are 20 inches in diameter or below. Uh, just to get our population down. Our goal is to try and get those trees down to the ground and get them replaced with a different species before they become too big and we have to hire the work out. We can handle, you know, trees this size and a little bit bigger in-house to save costs for the city. So implementation, the, the replacement process, we had a couple different programs. Uh, trade a tree program where we identify those areas in town that are really highly dense populated with ash trees. We're kind of removing every other one to lessen the impact. And when we remove a tree, we're kind of planting a tree in that same space, getting that one to establish, and we'll come back and remove the ash tree that's next to it and replace it. So it, we're not going in and, and clear cutting the entire ash population in the neighborhood. We're kind of trying to slowly turn over those ash trees uh, through, a, through a trade a tree program that's also funded through the Wisconsin DNR. Um, gravel bed nursery, uh, like Ken touched on, this started uh, a number of years ago. Hudson was kind of a pioneer for the gravel bed. And we can buy a number of ash trees, or not ash trees, a number of different species trees at a discounted rate because they are bare root, um, easy for our staff to plant. Um, it's just, you know, we can fit about 125 trees in this gravel bed and plant them throughout the, throughout the late summer and early fall. Um, Diversity, Chad touched on it. Here's uh, our, our favorite, the, the red maple. Um, so just encourage you to look at different species like, like Chad touched on. Um, and then with the plan, uh, the Hub Hudson Urban Forestry Board reviews that plan every year, uh, kind of where we were, where we want to go for the next year, uh, make plans. So we're constantly looking at that, um, you know, that EAB plan and making changes to it. And then community and support, um, you know, it's still fairly new to the city of Hudson. And like I said, there's only been a few confirmed cases in the city, but it's here and it's only going to get worse, you know, over the course of the next four to six years. Um, so, you know, forums like this, newsletters, social media posts, uh, I think a, a yearly presentation at city council is beneficial, uh, especially as we see the effects more and more 
uh, when we get some of our larger ash trees dying off to give residents and let them know what options are um, and what the city is doing. So, um, you know, trying to get that word out as far as the, the impacts of emerald ash borer and what the city is doing. I believe that's it. So, um, I want to encourage those of you that, that came that aren't on the Urban Forestry Board to uh, come downstairs to the atrium. There's a lot of good resources down there. There's a lot of uh, great professionals in the, in the building tonight. Um, Diana Alfuth from UW Extension, expert on emerald ash borer. I've listened to her talks a number of times. If you have any EAB questions, uh, ask her. Chad's going to be talking about pruning if you have any pruning questions. Uh, planting techniques. Uh, we have some examples of our gravel beds and the watering system down there. So I just want to encourage you to hang out. Like I said, got some refreshments down there and some, um, yeah. So, Tim. So, just a quick question for people at home. Um, so, the city's taking care of their trees, right? Yes. So ash trees, when they do become infected and end up dying, their, their structure isn't like a, uh, what are some of the trees that you see like out in the pastures in the Dakotas and they've been dead for probably 50 years and they're still standing? Yeah, like an elm tree. You know, the structure of an elm tree is, is different than an ash tree. The ash tree, the, the fibers and strands are shorter and, and br more brittle. So when an ash tree actually does die, it only takes a couple of years for that thing to start snapping off branches and so on and so forth where you have to get in there and take it down. So from a, from a contractor or an arborist perspective, they do not climb or they do not take down ash trees if it's more than 50% canopy loss? Um, yeah, I think actually uh, 40%. 40%. Yeah. They, yep. Yeah. So the arborist, because they become so dangerous climbing them, um, there comes a time where they won't even go up and climb, and climb them, which means for the homeowner that you're having to pay more for an arborist to come in with a bucket truck and take it down mechanically instead of climbing it and taking it down with ropes, that type of thing. So that's something to keep in mind as well is if you ultimately want to take down this ash tree and it's not, it's not worth having in your yard, you're going to want to remove it sooner rather than later to help save you costs. So good question. All right. Anything else? Yeah. That might be a, a question for Ken. Yeah. And that's, you know, whenever I go to any conference, they, they say, you know, you don't want to go over that 10 to 12 percent of any species within your community. So uh, once we get rid of the, our, once all the ash trees are gone, then the next thing will be maple trees because we got, um, to give you an idea, like I said, we got 1,200 ash trees in town. We have about 1,100 maple trees in the boulevards, just to give you an idea. That's the next biggest species in the city. So um, like I said, there'll come a day when we'll be fighting maples. So anyways, that's why we always stress diversity. And then one last thing, I heard a great quote that I want to share with everybody, and you might have heard this one before. I, at the Wisconsin Arborist Association conference, uh, one of the presenters said this to me, or said this to the group, he said, um, if, if trees gave off Wi-Fi, people would plant them everywhere. It, it's too bad they only give off free oxygen. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you <laughs> yeah.